Um, now let's welcome our last presenters. We will have Yili Ru and Jan Ronnie. They are both from Buddha's Digital Resource Center. They will be presenting Lowering the Barriers to Linked Open Data, a new metadata editor for DH. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jan Ronis, the Executive Director of Buddhist Digital Resource Center. Um, we, in case you don't uh, know about us, we are one of the, uh, the largest uh, organizations in Buddhist studies that um, makes uh, digital preservation of Buddhist manuscripts and also offers them on, online for free. And uh, so we were founded in 1999. Uh, we've been very active um, over the past nearly 25 years. And uh, to date, we have digitized tens of thousands, over 40,000 volumes of, of Buddhist texts, primarily in the Tibetan language. But since 2015, we've uh, branched out beyond the, the Tibetan sphere and uh, have uh, begun working directly in Southeast Asia as well. And, and uh, recently completed a large project in Cambodia, digitizing Khmer texts, and are uh, about halfway through a large project to digitize 11,000 bundles of palm leaf manuscripts in, in, in the Burmese script, uh, both in Pali and vernacular uh, Burmese. So we're called the Buddhist Digital Resource Center. And um, as you know, we, we have texts in the Tibetan language uh, that were digitized around Asia, including in um, inner Asia, Mongolia, but also Tibetan areas of, of China, the PRC, and uh, in South Asia, India and Nepal as well. Um, and then the, the text from Southeast Asia. But we aspire to have coverage of texts from across um, the, the Buddhist world. And BDRC itself cannot um, engage in digitization projects in Japan, Korea, uh, the Han areas of China and, and on and on, um, that would just be impossible. And in, in many of these places, it's not necessary for BDRC to come in and, and do work that would simply duplicate what um, you know, other, other projects have already taken care of. And so in um, 2017, we uh, initiated a project to create an entirely new um, digital platform for ourselves from the ground up that takes advantage of linked open data. Um, and the uh, appeal of linked open data to us was that it would uh, allow us to harvest uh, media created by other projects or housed at uh, museums um, that we could then integrate into our archive and database so that we could offer texts in Sanskrit and Chinese and, and other languages um, so that they would complement the text that we've digitized and also um, just create a, uh, a central hub for the majority of the, uh, the uh, Buddhist texts that have been digitized and are, and are available openly across the, uh, the web. So that's all I'm gonna say for now. I'd like to turn it over to BDRC's technical lead, the visionary behind our uh, move into linked open data, Eli Ru who's in France. Yeah, thank you, Jan. Um, so this presentation will be um, a little bit more technical than the um, uh, other presentations. Um, it will be a presentation about our experience in uh, our adoption of linked open data mm -hmm. and uh, the barriers that we had to overcome in order to create a fully uh, functional uh, infrastructure for linked open data and um, how we did that and you know, the tools we created. Um, <clears throat> so first a little introduction about um, why we used uh, linked open data. So as Jan said, it's, it's really becoming the emerging standard in library science, uh, museum science, and in many uh, academic projects, even though the specification is uh, from the early 2000s, it's uh, only gaining uh, momentum in the last four or five years. Um, and uh, 
you know, for 20 years, BDRC has been uh, really focused on open access. Uh, so both in, uh, in terms of the software, you know, using open source um, software in terms of data, having uh, open access data fully uh, available without any uh, restriction in the license. And uh, also for the images uh, that we uh, make available on the website. And uh, linked open data has uh, accessibility really built in, uh, in terms of technology. So that's why we wanted to adopt it. And also in terms of culture. So adopting linked data is uh, itself uh, kind of a signal that the data set is open and that we, uh, that others uh, can fully uh, use it for their research. And so that also uh, creates some new opportunities for partnerships. And uh, finally, in uh, linked open data, uh, there's really this strong sense of uh, connection between data sets of removing the, the silos of the different projects and having um, you know, much more connection uh, between you know, all sorts of data sets and, and ideally with the rest of the world. And <clears throat> that's really built in, in the technology and also again in the culture, uh, which allows for uh, more partnerships. Um, unfortunately, the, um, the adopting uh, RDF uh, or um, RDF is the data format of linked open data um, is quite uh, difficult and we had to overcome some obstacles uh, to fully implement um, uh, a platform of uh, linked open data. One of these issues is the um, focus of the specifications of RDF which is very much on the semantics and logics of the data. So it, it sort of assumes that there is already uh, uh, this giant global interconnected uh, knowledge graph that you know, machines can um, browse basically and get a, a lot of information. But it doesn't really say uh, how uh, this should be implemented. Um, it doesn't give uh, tools or recipes uh, for uh, a fully functional um, architecture or infrastructure. So there is um, uh, quite a, a strong lack of uh, engineering best practices. And that creates uh, a very strong barrier because when you start to want to implement linked open data, you realize that there is a lot that you, a lot of decisions that need to be made, need to be made that are uh, not obvious, and there is um, very few discussions about it, and you know, that creates uh, a lack of tools. Like for instance, we had to develop our own RDF editor, while you know if uh, an RDF editor already existed, we would have uh, just used it. And so this led us to um, uh, develop our own infrastructure and uh, also uh, want to document it uh, in order for other projects to adopt it. And uh, we created some open source tools, uh, um, both in the like some UIs and also the, the server. Um, that we hope uh, others can use too. And so the, the focus of the editor was to have a, a very simple and familiar UI. Uh, one of the issues you get into when you start to want to edit RDF is that it's, it's, you need to apply some constraints in order to uh, create a simple UI, otherwise it becomes very difficult. So I'm going to explain the constraints uh, in the next slides. And we also wanted uh, a simple infrastructure with some um, with some toolings that are very suited for production. So a, a lot of linked open data projects are, let's say, at the level of prototype, or you have a database and you just don't never modify it. So that's much easier uh, to implement. But in order to have a fully functional infrastructure where you have some versioning, some backup, um, you can restore the backups, you can export the database, work on it, etc. Uh, that's much more difficult, and that will be uh, the focus of this presentation. So, uh, as I said, we uh, we had to uh, put some constraints on what's possible with um, the RDF that we're using uh, in order to implement this infrastructure. So, this is an example of a, you know, a typical um, thing that you would encounter in RDF datasets. So, let's say this is, for instance, a birth event. 
So you have an event that's connected to a person and a place. But then um, what we need for our infrastructure to work is a way to divide uh, that kind of data into records. And um, that can be really anything. You can have you know, one record for person A, one record for event A, and one record for place B. But what we chose is to uh, you know, have some uh, records or documents uh, that would um, contain, in that case, you know, person A and the birth event of person A, which usually would be found in the document about person A, and then another document about place B. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, so this is very important because then what we will edit in the in our editor is really these documents. And so we have a way to uh, create RDF documents, which is not something that's uh, really uh, specified anywhere uh, in the specifications for independent data, which may appear surprising. And uh, the other constraints that we apply is that within one document, we don't allow um, any type of graph. Uh, so here uh, at the top, you have a, a cyclic graph. So you see that A is connected to D, to E, and then to A again. Uh, this is something that would make um, you know, a simple UI very, very difficult to make. So instead, we uh, only allow uh, three structures within a document. So for A, you would have you know, connections to B and C, but you know, it would never go up to A again. And this allows you know, each document to have an identifiable route. Um, in order for our um, editor to be fully uh, configurable and you know, adapted by any DH project, we are using Shackle, which is an RDF vocabulary to um, specify some constraints uh, on the RDF, like you know, one entity of the type person must have uh, this property and this property must be of that type, et cetera, et cetera. And so this allows us also to specify some uh, parts of the UI. So that makes our editor fully configurable. So the theoretically it can be used by any project even outside of Buddhist studies. Um, and finally, the, um, the infrastructure that uh, we implemented is the following one. So at the top, let's say closest to the user, we have um, a web app. So it's created in uh, React and uh, Recoil. Um, so this is really the front end. It uses the, um, the Shackle um, vocabulary to, uh, in, to create the UI for the user. And the, um, it, it just uh, gets some data and sends uh, the data to the editor server. And so here, that's where uh, things get uh, interesting. So the, the editor server first validates the, the data that it receives um, through Shackle. And then, so the, the, the two parts will only exchange documents. So the documents can contain any number of nodes, et cetera, that we've seen. And the, um, then the editor will send the, the document and uh, create um, or update a file on a Git repository and uh, commit uh, this modification or this creation. Then the, the commit ID uh, will be sent back to the server and the, the commit ID and the document will be sent to the, the triple stores or the RDF database, which then will be uh, used uh, by uh, our query server to just uh, implement uh, the website, the search on the website. So this creates um, an infrastructure where every modification by uh, that is uh, logged and is uh, fully uh, viewable. You can view every step of the modifications that have been made on one file, or you can see all the modifications that have been on in, uh, done in one day or by a certain user, et cetera. So this creates uh, a very good versioning and also this is uh, a backup of our data that we can then you know, put back in the triple store. We can uh, verify the coherence between the RDF files and the triple store through the git commit, et cetera. And you know, because these are just files on the file system and using Git repository and Git has you know, very 
uh, strong tools that are used in production everywhere, then um, you know this creates a, a very uh, strong infrastructure that's very reliable infrastructure that you can use in production uh, without any issue. And that's what we um, have done for the last years. So then we we hope that you know, this uh, infrastructure that we implemented can be used as a template for uh, you know, infrastructure in uh, similar DH projects. And uh, for BDRC, uh, the obvious um, you know, uh, benefit is that we now have a, a new editor that's configurable, that's very modern. Um, for Buddhist studies, we hope that uh, since uh, our vocabulary can be used in uh, many other Buddhist study pro studies projects. Uh, our editor could be used directly uh, by other projects. Um, for uh, in digital humanities in general, and you know, developers for uh, linked open data in, in general, even outside of the humanities, we hope that this type of architecture and the tools that we have developed uh, can uh, also be adopted. And so we hope that um, in the end, it, this will uh, lower the entry barrier to uh, linked open data for digital humanities. So I just have a few um, screenshots of the editor. So, I mean, this is uh, interesting because there's actually not a lot to see. It's a very kind of boring editor, which uh, is what we wanted uh, because usually uh, RDF editors can be a bit creative, which is uh, can be an obstacle for general users. And so here, you know, on the left, you have uh, some of the entities that are some of the documents, let's say, that the user has opened. And here, this one is selected, and we see that you know, it's, uh, there's the identifier, the type, uh, you can view it on the website. And here, you have very few properties. Uh, this is one of them. You can select the line tag, and here, you see that the, the shackle uh, specified that there must be at least one uh, preferred label and here it's empty so the editor complains. And here you have an example with sub nodes. So here in the sort of uh, vocabulary that we are using for persons, every name is a sub node. So here you can see that it has several properties. One is the, the type of name and the other uh, is the, the actual name. And um, so you can select, uh, so we have different uh, forms you know, in the UI. Here you can select the type, here you can uh, type the, the name and you can add another node here. Uh, and finally, uh, when you have to uh, select an entity, like for instance, if you are on the record of a person and you want to say, okay, the, the teacher of this person is this other person in the database. Um, you can do it by uh, searching for a name here, uh, and you can select the type and the, the language of the string that you're searching. And this will open a, a, a pop-up window on the main website, so this will give the very familiar uh, search. Uh, and then you can click on one result, and this, it will add the results to the, the list uh, at the bottom. So um, that's it for our presentation. I hope uh, it can uh, inspire uh, some other projects to move to linked open data. Thank you, Jen and Eli, for your wonderful presentation. Um, now questions are open for all the panelists in this session. So if you have a question, please use raise a hand feature where write your question in the chat. So I see in the chat, there is one question from Madalena um, to Jen and Eli about... I was just curious about the image, sorry. <laughs> the image with which you started your presentation because I've never seen it. Sorry, it wasn't really related to the topic. Um, I do have a question actually from Sharon who had to leave, but she uh, asked me to relate it. So I'm gonna put it in the chat um, just because it's a bit long, but I'm also gonna read it. Um, she wanted to address the first presentation about Sharon. Uh, so she says, I was curious about the nature of Sharon's diary, which Greet alluded to. Uh, I suppose it was compiled for official purposes 
as a form of report uh, on performance of duty. Is that the case? And if so, what are the implications of the nature of the document for the current endeavor to reconstruct Shirao's movements? I would suppose there are a lot of lacunae, for example, but on the other hand, perhaps also patterns that allow for more grounded work, that, sorry, more grounded guesswork. Uh, and do they intend to discover more shared patterns when applying these methods for more cases from roughly the same period? So there are like five questions in there actually, but uh, you're welcome to address any aspect um, related to this. Thank you. Yeah, she's kind of opening up a can of worms there. Um, yeah, but, um, it's a, <laughs> that's why she left. <laughs> Yeah, the answers are very complicated. Um, so I I would say it's not an official document uh, because we do get a bit of private information as well. Um, and there are, you know, in from Chin Tombs, uh, there are a bunch of other documents um, of this of this type. Um, so. Um, and yeah, I'm, so I'm I'm trying to address these questions. But it's it's uh, I mean, in in things that I'm writing at the moment, it's it's all complex. But we, I mean, I do think we can get some kind of a picture of this man that goes beyond uh, him as official. I think that's maybe behind uh, the the many questions. And you know, I'll 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 be in touch with Sharon uh, about the more particular things uh, if, if if she wants. The the last uh, presenters, especially to uh, Ili, the so I mean the, the project that we're having with um, um, kind of we're also creating databases of people who go and kind of people linked to places etc cetera, etc cetera. and we're having quite a bit of, because we have so many people and so many different groups of people and so many relationships between them I mean is what you're doing because you're, it's really text-based, but is there a possibility for even us to use these kind of things for? Um... Well, yes, of course. So the, um, initially the DRC uh, was, let's say a cataloging project, but there is also um, a lot of uh, prosopographical data in the database, like in mm -hmm. the sense that, you know, who is the teacher of who, uh, who was the abbot of what monastery, yeah, et cetera. Yeah, so yeah, we have yeah. about, uh, data on about 20,000 persons and about 10,000 cases. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, the, I mean, this is all something that um, uh, can be queried on the website and can be exported in you know, some ways. And one of the um, uh, sort of things that we would like to achieve is to become some sort of um, Gazetteer, uh, or you know, to have the BDRC IDs for the persons, which are uh, mm -hmm. very stable, etc., uh, mm -hmm. so could be used uh, by other projects to refer to uh, some persons in particular yeah. and places, yeah. etc. Yeah. Yes, this is really something that we are uh, trying to achieve. So, if you have some ideas or connections that we yes. can make, yes. this yes. would be yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll be in touch and, and see whether, yeah, sure. whether you can actually help us because we're trying to create something that's user friendly and it is, that's not too complicated and at the same time does everything we want it to do. With. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. yeah, I'll put my uh, email address in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Arlena, please. Yeah, I'm not sure if Jen Ronis, did you unmute yourself for a moment? Did you want to jump yes. in? No, no, that's all right. Uh, in the interest of time. To go first. Oh, yeah. Um, well, my, yeah, okay. So I, I, I'll be quick. Uh, I had a question for uh, Engine and Tugba. I don't know if I'm pronouncing your names correctly. I'm really sorry. Sorry, so um, I knew nothing about this phenomenon. It's really interesting. I was just curious, it's not strictly related to what you're doing in terms of DH, but um, are you able from the data that you have to gather sort of social background? Because I assume is the information is not always there um, for, for these people. In terms of demographics, the information is not there at all usually, but previous studies and you know more journalistic research in the US UK context which I think is safe to assume kind of carries over here 
points to the people here being mostly young males in their like 20s to 30s or some teenagers also in that demographic and class I think is a bit more of a mixed bag but it's mostly kind of lower class also and possibly less educated men but uh, that kind of information because it's an online forum it's very hard to get and to the best of my knowledge there's a bit of hostility towards researchers and journalists and other you know kind of online commentators because there's a uh, an aspect of perceived persecution against these kind of communities where they don't feel really comfortable speaking to outsiders who are studying it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was thinking in terms of the, the language, if it was possible to see like people who have been there for longer, for example, and or, or if the language gives away something about their age, but I was just, it was just a curiosity. Um, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, again, door. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, and nice to see you. And thank you so much for you know um, sharing your latest uh, developments on the VDRC. One of really, really wonderful projects, um, a really revolutionary tool for all of us in Buddhist studies and beyond. For anybody who does anything related, remotely related to Buddhism. Um, so I have a question about. Um, um, the the user platform of BDRC and I guess the future kind of revolutions of the database um, and how it's uh, presented um, or is being accessed to researchers. Uh, so this is a question that I've been hearing from uh, my kind of scholar circles. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have expressed their concern for the new interface. A lot of people really like it and they think it's really slick. It's very easy to use. There's a lot of new functions that are really, really important for research. But also a lot of people have sort of expressed um, the fact that they're nostalgic for the old platform, the old website, mm -hmm. um, and you know how they've developed already a habit of using the old website. They know where to go. They know how to look up things. So I was wondering, um, is there a component of incorporating actually the user's experience, their own very subjective kind of personal <laughs> experiences, right? Their own kind of developed little habits here and there, uh, idiosyncrasies uh, into the development of new um, ways of presenting the database or new ways of incorporating new tools? Just a very random <laughs> question, but wondering what you think. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, and we'll have time perhaps uh, at IATS um, in a couple of weeks to, to talk about this more um, face to face, but just um, to give the general context to, to everyone else that's here. The old um, platform did not use linked open data, did not have a, a very sophisticated um, search interface uh, at all. And that led to, say, a lot of noise in the search results, which um, people over time learned how to just filter um, on their own. Um, and then the noise that would be returned also led to some interesting sort of discoveries that were entirely accidental. So just briefly to give an example, with, on the old uh, website, there was only one search box. There was no filtered searching. If you searched on um, a, a string, it would take a long time to return the results. And, and while the search engine was working, it would query everything in the data and then give you all of the results um, in a way that was not ranked in any particular order because you didn't specify whether you were looking for a place or a person or a text title or something. It sort of gave you um, everything that was uh, not even relevant, but just everything that had the syllables that you were searching on. Sometimes syllables, you know, uh, that were very far apart from each other. And so clearly not, not relevant. Um, somehow people are very nostalgic for that, uh, you know, randomized and unranked uh, searching. The way we do it now um, is that you, uh, you know, 
search on on books or places or persons or topics um uh and when you are entering your query you you type in um what you want in in the language or script that that uh is is relevant and then you you specify simply whether it's a text or a topic or a place and then it gives you the results for um just that and but on the search results page just to the left there's a an additional menu that lets you know whether this search query the search string also appears in a different data category such as place or text title or uh within an e-text um and so it, it doesn't bar you or block you from seeing other things that that might be uh, relevant but are not what you're looking for um so there's you can easily uh, toggle uh, back and forth but um nevertheless we one reason we wanted to implement the search filtering is that we have some special um ways of reporting on certain types of data when you search on them so place would be a good example if you search on the name of a monastery it'll return all of the results that have uh, that name that's good that's just a plain list like you would find for other things but it will also plot the locations of all of the the monasteries that have the name you're looking for on a map because uh, I don't know how it is with other Buddhist traditions, but in Tibet, there's a lot of repetition of monastery names. There's different, you know, of course, differences, but a lot of cliched names that keep reappearing as parts of broader names. So we thought that, you know, by plotting everything on a map, it would be a really great um, research aid because yes, there might be 17 monasteries with your name, but if you already know the general location, then you can click on that, that place on the map. Well, we couldn't provide those kinds of extra services if we just provided you know, people with everything all at once on, on one page. So we're adding a, a little bit of filtering in. I, I don't believe that it's you know, anything more than you would find on a uh, search interface for an airline or Amazon. Um, but uh, I, I, yes, have heard many times that that people, I think, because of the the confusing nature of the previous website, have have um, developed many idiosyncratic um, ways of of overcoming this, and uh, maybe they they confuse their own idiosyncratic ways of of filtering the data with actually what the BDRC, the old search engine, was actually doing, and they thought that the the old search engine was actually you know artificially intelligent when it wasn't. Uh, whereas now we're, we're creating things like search rankings based on popularity indexes, um, chrono chronology, and so forth. Um, but still, I, I don't mean to sound like we're, we're not interested in, in the feedback. And uh, we respond uh, you know, on a weekly basis to people who, who ask, oh, can you tweak this? Can you tweak that? Um, but just because of the nature of the data, as you see, um, we with our, our linked open data, um, there's, there's no going back to having something that is undi un indivisibly just sort of one big um, bucket of, of data all in one language. So another thing to say is that we're, we're now working in multiple languages. So we can't, whereas in the past it was all either in Tibetan, Wiley or English. And the search engine didn't discriminate between those and the users didn't have to discriminate either because we only used one we only focused on one buddhist tradition the tibetan but now we we have more so it's a it's a growing pain and we're trying to make it more uh more user friendly but uh when you when you yeah work across traditions um there are there are compromises and, and trade-offs that, that need to be made uh but just in terms of linked data uh Yes, it's it's allowed us to um, partner with uh, museums, libraries, uh, other Buddhist organizations like CBETA, SAT, and uh, 84,000 and so forth. So we're sharing data, we're perfecting it. Um, we have projects with Wikidata and so forth. So we're trying to put it out there. And so when it comes to, uh, yeah, Grietz, uh uh, project. Yeah, I, I bet that, um, you know, there's a lot of these, a lot of this geodata already, you know, well attested on wiki 
key data and elsewhere, and it won't take much time at all to to harvest it, and that'll give you a, you know the confidence that it's already been sort of um, crowdsourced and is uh, is relatively accurate. But there'll be you know lots of corrections and probably new new records that you'll want to contribute to the broader broader conversation. Um, and it's only with linked data that you can do that. Thank you so much for answering that question. I mean, it's really interesting to see the relationship between the actual users, right, scholars and students, and how their practices influence the structure and restructuring of, of databases. And, and um, I have to say the VDRC and, um, and all of the related databases, the collaborations that you guys have been doing in the past years, it's so inspiring to witness. I hope more kind of databases across different fields will be able to do this in the future. Yeah, so I, I have to stop here and, and give more time to our um, upcoming presentation. Thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it looks like that our time is up. Unfortunately, we can now take more questions. I would like to thank all the uh, presenters who have offered a fantastic presentation and for all the participants who have attended this wonderful session. Thank you. And we will have a five minute break and then we will come back for the last session of our conference.